All right, today we are talking about how entrepreneurs can bounce back from significant adversity. My guest today is Jeff Hill, who experienced just a series of tragic situations from a very young age. And he's gonna tell his story about how he bounced back from all of that, was able to build up his business to eight figures and beyond. I'll tell you more about him in a second, so stay tuned. Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we feature top entrepreneurs, business leaders, and thought leaders, and ask them how they built key relationships to get where they are today. Now, let's get started with the show. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show. You know, every week I get to talk to smart CEOs and founders of all kinds of companies. And you can check out our archives for episodes with the co-founders or CEOs of Netflix and Kinko's, Grubhub, Redfin, Quicken, you name it, Lending Tree. Go check them out. Got lots of great episodes there. And of course, this episode brought to you by Rise25, where we help B2B businesses to get clients referrals and strategic partnerships with Done For You podcasts and content marketing. And if you go to our website at rise25.com, you can learn all about what we do there. All right, uh, Jeff, I'm excited to have you here today. You have just an incredible story um, of experiencing adversity, as I said, from the, a young age. Today, you are a semi-retired entrepreneur, but your story is really incredible. So first, you lose a father um, to cancer um, in your teenage years. Um, you, you even you know, didn't have a lot of money growing up. You know, as a kid, you were going out with your father to cut firewood and sell it later. Um, in your 20s, your marriage and business fails. In your 30s, you battle cancer and walk away from a dream home. And in spite of this, you're a really positive guy. And I love that enthusiasm about you. Um, you built up a 1-800-GOT-JUNK uh, franchise, one of the most uh, successful ones in the system. And you have been in business 20 years with that uh, particular franchise. So I'm so excited to hear this story, but you know, I often start people with their childhood and any entrepreneurial side hustles that uh, they got involved in. And when you and I were talking beforehand, you said, me and my dad would go and cut firewood and then uh, sell it to make Ed's ends meet. So um, bring us back to that period in your life, what that was like with your father going out um, and cutting wood. You know, I, I imagine at the time, like most kids, you're like, Ugh, I don't want to do this, but now you probably think back fondly to it. Yeah. Well, first of all, John, thanks for thanks for having me. I'm excited to join your podcast. I've I've listened to several and um I think you do you're doing great work. And uh and I love that we swim in similar circles. So some of the folks I know or I've I've heard their stories and so I'm happy to be a part of it. So um yeah, you know, growing up, uh cutting firewood on the weekends was a regular event. Um, you know, it, it wasn't all uh, bad stuff. You know, it meant I got to go to the woods and go camping and it meant that I got to go fishing when we, were, when we were done or ride motorcycles or whatever. So as a young teenager, I never, never looked at it as much of a burden. It was more of a cool time with my dad. And, you know, now having lost him, you know, uh, in my, in my late teens, you know, I look back and I would have done anything to spend my weekends doing that. I, I, in now, and, and in fact, it's probably shaped who I am as a parent, making sure that I get out and do that type of thing with, with my kiddos, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's such precious time with our kids, you know, when they're young to, to do that. Um, so th that was a bit, a bit of your upbringing. Um, did you have a uh, kind of beyond the the firewood you know were you in your you know in high school and college were you like starting little businesses like some entrepreneurs do or yeah i mean we did the typical uh you know neighborhood uh lemonade stands and whatever but um you know i think i started kind of coming into myself and my um entrepreneurial interests and whatnot probably around maybe sixth grade you know i i had a amazing sixth grade teacher who who um uh, taught up uh, public speaking uh, and kind of debate class uh, for sixth grade. And it kind of introduced me to the idea of, of going first, being the first to jump, uh, putting yourself out there and getting, 
getting rewarded. You know, I, I discovered in sixth grade that if you volunteer to go first, the teacher grades you a little bit easier. And, you know, I wasn't the brightest kid. So, you know, I needed every advantage I could get. And, and, uh, you know, now my wife, um, refers to that as the first to jump syndrome. And, she, and, and she, it, it drives her crazy because I'm always the first one to either make a decision or, or, you know, jump off that, that big rock or whatever. But, um, it sounds so like think, a book title for you. Yeah. First to yeah, jump. First to jump. Like some, exactly. So, you know, I think some of that, and then, you know, in, in high school, I was um, editor of my annual and I got involved in student leadership and in, in college, um, you know, big part of college. And, and in fact, a big part of now my, my friendship group and my tribe is, you know, we, we um, I went to a small uh, state uh, college, Eastern Washington University, and, and there wasn't much of a Greek system there. There was, at the time, there were two fraternities and neither of them kind of foot fit our fancy and so me and some buddies um we started we brought a chapter of phi delta theta to eastern and and you know that really became a kind of a defining um uh time for me you know with these young men and then of course my dad passing um uh, a year and a half into college you know they were they were my support system and and they were the people that i looked to for um mentorship or guidance or, or whatever when you know when when i didn't have a parent to to do that with. So, um, and then now, you know, still, I just got back from a, a, a 10 day motorcycle ride and, um, five of the nine participants were old college buddies. So, um, wow. so clear, clearly those relationships, um, stuck with me, but definitely, uh, but yeah, yeah I've always, was... I've always had a little bit of a little bit of a, don't be afraid to just try, try something new and make something happen for yourself type of person. Yeah. So you you actually kind of went a, a corporate route. You actually worked in the call center world, which w was actually brought you to one eight hundred got junk because you actually came. You heard about this up upstart company, and you interview for a job as a call center director. You don't get the job, but they sell you on buying a franchise, which I <laughs> yeah. love. So they must have been pretty compelling. Uh, tell us about that. How that went? Yeah, that's actually it's a it's a neat story. Um, uh, I. You know, I was with a company called Western Wireless, which then became a company called Voice Stream Wireless, which then became T-Mobile. So I was an early adapter in the T-Mobile um, brand. And um, at the time when it was Western Wireless, I, they hired me to be a, um, uh, I was in the financial services sector. Um, and I was the first manager they hired to start the financial services group for what what they then branded as um voice stream wireless um and so i took um i took about 14 people with me and we started this team and we built it up and so so i had a, a kind of a um very quick and dirty uh startup experience uh early in my career and it was great and um and then um it grew. We grew from that 14 to when I left that company and that was six years later, my department was over 2000 people. And so, um, so it was a lot and it wasn't as fun anymore. I liked, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I like being the janitor and the CEO. And so when I was starting that team and we were doing everything and we were writing policies and creating quality programs and doing everything you do in the corporate world to help a growing business, that was awesome. But then when it got so big and it was hard to make things happen and move, you know, I was ready to go. And, um, and fortunately at the time I had a, um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess for her, but, you know, I had a senior manager who, um, was getting a severance package, um, because there was some, um, overlap with, with my department and another department. Um, and that package looked pretty good. And so I went, you know, they, it, they came to me a couple of weeks later and were talking to me about doing something different within the organization. And I just said, you know, that seems like a material difference in what I'm doing now. And I think um, I'd love to just have one of those packages you put together for my senior man manager and and we'll just call it a day. And so so I left um, I left T-Mobile the first time. Cause I, I actually went back later, but, um, you came back 10 yeah, years later. Or yeah. So I, yeah. I left on really good terms, but it was, it was time for me to try something new. And, um, and then with that severance package, I was shopping and, uh, and, uh, I, the, the story about how it came across when it got junk is one of those stories that for me, I have about maybe five of them that have happened in my life, but there was, you know, I was reading this 
job description and the way that it was written, it just resonated with me. It was, I could tell it was written by someone that was, um, that thought like I thought that was future focused, that was entrepreneurial, but also very positive. And, and that was Brian Scudamore that wrote that job, that Mm -hmm. job description. And that was to run his, his call center. And so I did some research and that call center had just one call center of the year, you know, and I come from, I was coming from the call center business, one of the big telecoms, right? And so, you know, it beat out folks like American Express and Discover and all the people that you would think of when you think of call centers. And so I'm like, how is this little junk company winning call center of the year? So something special there. So, um, so yeah, uh, I went up and went to go interview to run that call center for them and uh, really got caught up in the whole um, the vibe and the people and the energy and everything there. And, and, and they had like a panel format where yeah, yeah. multiple applicants. Is yeah, that right? Yeah. So they were, you know, at the time, this stuff was really cutting edge. You know, people didn't do a lot of these types of things. But so it was really fun. And I love that type of thing. And so, yeah, we did this. Uh, it was I think it was called a reverse panel interview or something. Yeah. But we're interviewing. And, you know, one of the questions I remember was, you know, if we didn't hire you for this position, who in this classroom should we hire? And I thought that was funny. But everybody was saying they should hire me. And um, well, that's. Which nice, was nice. Nice which was compliment. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was very complimentary. But, um, but, uh, so they, <laughs> they didn't, they didn't, hire they you. didn't. In <laughs> fact, um, in fact, I think you know, uh, Cameron Harold. Um, yes. I've interviewed so, him twice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he's, um, so he basically looked was he at me on the said, panel? Was he interviewing? Yeah. Him? He was okay. one of the people on the panel. And okay. so was Brian Scudamore. And they okay. both kind of looked at each other and said, you know, they thought I'd be bored running a 30 person mm. call center. And the truth was, I, you know, um, I was interested in it, but I was, I was more interested in the company. And, um, and I did have a severance package in my back pocket that I was, w- was trying to figure out how I was going to spend and invest. And, and so, yeah, so they basically said, you know, we're not going to hire you for this, but you know, we had just, they had just bought back the East side of Seattle, the Bellevue, um, Kirkland Redmond area from the previous franchise partner, because he was Canadian and he couldn't get financing for the trucks. And so he couldn't expand as fast as he needed to. And so, so, you know, I walked into, I mean, really a franchise that's in Bill Gates's territory. I was Mm. like, this seems like a no brainer. And so, so I took my severance and, uh, and invested in a couple trucks and started out driving around. Now, some other time I'll tell you the story because it's funny because right around the same time, 2003, I was a I had been a speecher for the governor of California at the time. Arnold Schwarzenegger wins in California as the governor and I lose my job. And then Jerry Brown, who later became governor again a second time and ran for president. You probably know Jerry Brown mm-hmm. came up. He was mayor of Oakland at the time. He came up to Sacramento and to his credit, interviewed a bunch of us who just lost our job in the recall because he's trying to like headhunt like good people. Right. And I did a panel interview where I was with colleagues and, and Jerry Brown, one of the weirdest experiences in my life. <laughs> and the weird thing about it is when you're doing an interview with colleagues, you know how you kind of elaborate, you know? Well, if the person next to you is elaborating, you're like, well, wait a second, I did that. What you're claiming credit for, it was really funny. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. but uh, <laughs> this interview is for you, so I won't, I won't tell the full version of that. But I want to hear, um, so you, you end up going from, so you go from like call center world, you think you're, you're interviewing for a call center director, and you end up chunking, you know, putting down this chunk of money that you would just gotten from your, you know, severance package. Mm-hmm. And what was it like in the early days? You know, was it hard to figure out? Did they had the the franchise system, had the, the corporate headquarters really figured it out? So you had good support um, and you were able to figure yeah, things out? Yeah, I it mean, take a while? you know, I, um, you know, I've only been part of a couple franchise models, so it's hard to compare. You know, I was never part of a McDonald's or anything, but, you know, as far as, you know, I had run my own business before and we skipped over that. But when I was still in Spokane right after college, I was bored with trying to find real jobs and there was nothing there. And so I started a lost luggage company hauling lost luggage for the airlines out of Spokane International Airport. So that's a whole nother story. Mm-hmm. But um, what I learned is, that, you know, that that's kind of the right. I think working for myself was the way I wanted to go. And so I, you know, I wasn't afraid to learn, learn as I went and stuff like that. And, you know, and, um, but, uh, they did a pretty good job. They had, they, you know, 
the manual, the training manuals were still being written and stuff like that. So some of the stuff was early, but they generally listened to their franchise partners. They did have folks that the early adapters that had a real track record of success. So they were super inspiring. And so we would a lot of times copy what they were doing. And really, you know, um, we formed several groups within um, of, of other franchise partners that were experiencing similar growth, ex- growth or, or, or challenges or um, government regulations or whatever we're dealing with. And so, you know, so I always felt relatively supported. And then, you know, the way they do it, I mean, like a lot of franchises is it's your business. You know, I mean, you're the one that has to go out and hustle. You're the one that that dons the blue wig and goes and waves off bridges to get people to honk. I mean, that's mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and so in that way, it's, it's not uh, very different from someone who's just starting, starting it completely for themselves, you know? So. And now see, there were some rough patches. I was reading mm-hmm. beforehand, you had some incidents of theft early on. Oh, yeah. um, it was maybe a, a little bit too much of a casual culture and you actually ended up having to do a sting and you found out that, your friend and longtime assistant had been embezzling from you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, um, oh, it still gets me a little fired up, but, um, Isn't but, it crazy? you know, here we are 20 years later yeah. and well, it's, it's like, just, it just happened recently. You know, it's just like when somebody steals your mail, you know, you just feel personally violated. And, yeah. and for me, it was never about the money. It was that she was on my inner circle, you know, and mm-hmm. it was, and then, you know, so she was here as she was an admin that, um, w- she was my admin when I was a director at T-Mobile you know, Mm -hmm. and I left and I was starting my own business and she had had, um, twins, uh, which coincidentally I have twins now, but, um, and so, you know, she was looking for a part-time gig and I, you know, probably couldn't even offer more than part-time. So it was, it felt like a good fit. And, and, you know, we went through some, um, some growth and, you know, and I'm hiring a lot of, you know, 18 to 24 year old kids and, and there was theft, you know, there was stuff happening and, and, but, you know, the sad part was we would always look to the drivers and the navigators and these kids is the reason that we were having gaps or losses or, um, and, um, and it turns out all along, even that year of it, I basically had to sell, you know, 55% of the business and I liquidated my 401k to meet payroll that year, she had systematically embezzled about $22,000 from me. So it was just like, that was just a punch in the gut. And that was a little bit of a, okay, let's circle the wagons. If we're, if, if we're going to hold on to this, we essentially need to start over. I need to find out who my real friends are. And, <laughs> and, and, and now, you know, my mind goes to like, now we have better technology. We can accept more digital payments. We could even set up little cameras everywhere if we want yeah. to, or sensors yeah. or something like that. What did you do back then in order to prevent it from happening after you'd experienced that? Well, you know, the thing you got to remember is you don't have scale when you're just in startup, right? You, you, everything is, you're doing it kind of back of the napkin, you know, now I have multiple locations. We have safes, we have, you know, handoff protocols and we have cameras, all that stuff, of course. But, you know, I didn't even have a office, right? I mean, I was running it out of my home office and guys were meeting, you know, where we'd park the truck strategically out in the community, you know? And so it's like, where do you put the envelope that has the receipts and the maybe a couple people paid cash? Well, sometimes that cash didn't make it back. And so it was ugly and clunky. And, you know, and it was obviously, um, it, you know, I took ownership of it for sure, but it was, uh, you know, it was just part of the growing yeah. pains of starting, you know, going from being a small to a medium sized business. And yeah. so, um, it's so hard yeah, to that was, still be angry about that. One of the yeah, law firms yeah. I worked at before I became an entrepreneur, there was an embezzlement after I left and, you know, I was furious. Well, it's, you know, I mean, if you've done it for yourself and you, you know how much blood, sweat and tears you put into your business. And then when to hear that somebody was yeah. nonchalantly doing that, it's just, it's frustrating. But, but I'll tell you the good news about that story. And this, you know, this is something, you know, I always try to look at the positive. That's when I knew I had the right guy as my GM. Cause I had just brought in Jay and he had been working alongside of me and, and he took it upon himself to do essentially do a sting operation and, and follow these dollars and, 
you know, put, put some money in there that people didn't know was there and all this stuff. And he tracked it down and he's the one that figured out exactly how she'd been doing it and how much she did and, and all that. And so we were able to, um, you know, get her out of the organization and clean things up and, yeah. and, and really that became the foundation, uh, for my relationship with Jay, which is, you know, it's just based on just 100% honesty and, and, you know, me as the, as a founding partner, who's, you know, like I said, relatively absentee most of the time. Um, my job for is just to trust him, um, remove obstacles and, you know, and, you know, allow him to go out there and get it done. And so we've created a, a pretty unique culture and, um, and, and he lines them up and, you know, he's, he's not, he's not afraid of the work. If I can get it to yeah. him, he's going to, he's going to execute. So it's, it's been a great partnership. Now, another thing you found early on is that some of your younger employees are having a hard time relating to the mindset of your customers and the, you know, the customers are thinking, I want to pay someone to remove this junk for me. I don't want to do it myself. The young employees were kind of thinking like, I would, I would never pay the money for this. Yeah. I would do it myself. Right. And so yep. you had an interesting reaction to that. You ended up taking three of your young leaders out to a fine steakhouse so they could see what high end service was like and kind of appreciate it. So tell us that story. Yeah, that's, um, it was a really fun exercise and, you know, and I understood, you know, I was young too. And I, man, if I had to move, you know, I wouldn't call a moving company. I'd call my buddies. And I mean, that's what you do when you're younger, right? Mm -hmm. When you're in your twenties and, and, um, but what I was trying to show them, um, was that, um, it's, it's all perspective. And, and when you're delivering customer service, there's value in that. And, and if you do it right, um, people are never going to question the price. And so, you know, I'd taken them. Um, um, these are a couple of my, my, my budding leaders, the folks that I was kind of promoting up into the um, leadership roles. And, and, um, and, you know, I, I had taken them out and taken them to a, a place in Bellevue. It's just, it's not even there anymore. It's been torn down an old kind of divey bar. And, you know, we got some wings and we were throwing some darts and I just said, Hey, instead of having, you know, we had our appetizer, why don't we go have dinner up the street? And, um, and that, you know, of course they were game, you know, the boss says he's buying and we're just going to go up the street to have dinner. And so, so I took him to um, the top floor of Daniel's in, in Bellevue and I had prearranged the table and, and um, took him to a really nice dinner overlooking Bellevue and the Seattle skyline. And, and we had awesome service and, and drank a bottle of wine and, and, um, and then, you know, the bill came around and, and I discreetly kind of asked them what they thought the bill would be. And, and, and they were, you know, it was interesting because most of them hadn't eaten at a place like that, but, but they were all relatively close, you know, but, um, but I showed them the bill and I said, you know, this is interesting. I said, this is coincidentally the same as our average job size. I said, so what if we tried to deliver the same experience, the same feeling that we got at this fine dining steakhouse to every one of our customers? Do you think they'd ever balk at the price? And they, you know, and it, it just gave them a little bit different perspective. And so we, you know, we go into it and, you know, the, I've always said in this business, it's the little things, you know, the business in the service business, everybody does a relatively similar job, but it's the folks that do the little things well and consistently that, um, that, you know, that really shine. And, and, and it, so it, that's sort of in our it, mantra. You know, in your world, things. what what were those little things like sweeping up after a yeah. job or something? Yeah, yeah. clean, okay. shiny trucks, friendly, uniform drivers, on time service, do the call ahead, sweep up after, you know, hey, I noticed this was sitting here. Do you want me to put that away for you? You know, the barbecue is over here. Should we put it in the garage? You know, little things mm -hmm. that might take one or two minutes extra. But those customers are like, oh, wow, I didn't know how I was going to get that in there. Thank you. You know, because, mm -hmm. you know, we come in and. I love it. My business partner used to say this. He's like, we, we, when we go to a job, we leave with two things, junk and money. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> and we need to, and we need to make sure that, that, you know, these people feel like they got value out of what we provided because there are times where we're, we'll roll in. And I mean, our guys are efficient. We have the right tools. We have the right size trucks. We go in and I mean, I could empty your garage and be out of there in 30 minutes and I might, you know, Jeez. it might be, would it you might please? Be, my garage no. is a mess. So. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, I'm there 30 minutes and we, you know, we, let's say we charge you 750 bucks for a full truckload. You're like, Whoa, that was a lot of money. Well, it's like, yeah, but you know, some about having the right tools, the right equipment. Solved though. Yeah. Yeah. Solved. yeah. Now. Um, so you you own the company in 2008 
2008, 2009, of course, we all know that the national economy in the United States took a downturn during those years. And it hit you a little bit later, um, as did many of us here on the West Coast of the United States. It Mm -hmm. didn't. So, 09, you did well, 2010, and it was around 2020 or 2010 or 2011 that things really started to um, go down for you. And um, you had a really interesting response. You ended up buying another startup or investing in another startup, <laughs> this company well, called Frogbox. Yeah. Talk yeah, a little yeah, about yeah. some of the synergies there because it's a great lesson. Well, it's actually, um, it's kind of funny because um, Frogbox actually came after. I actually bought, um, I bought Tacoma. Uh, one of her got junk. So I bought out a, a, a local franchise at the time. This is in 09. So, so um, okay. So, so, you're, so were you losing money at the time or are you? Yeah. I mean, well things, we were, we were, um, you know, we came off of 08 and we grew and 09, we thought we were going to do okay. I mean, I grew 60%. And, and so I'm like, okay, I think we may dodge this thing. And, and I figured if I added some scale, I knew that Tacoma hadn't been developed at all. And so even if I kind of parked it, I think I thought I could cover my small business loan and, and whatnot. And so that was happening. And then at the same time uh, that that was happening, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Right. And, um, and so that was happening. And so it just, it was a lot. It was a lot all at once. The downturn was happening. I was, you know... And so that's when I started seriously entertaining the idea of just getting out of the business altogether. And um, thank goodness, you know, I have I was part of EO Entrepreneur Organization, and and I had a great group of uh, leaders and mentors, some of which I think you you saw this last week. But um, so so they kind of helped me navigate through it, and ultimately, um, about a year later, I decided to partner up, and I used the capital that I partnered up with to um, kind of write, write the business again. You know, we were a little bit on our heels and, and, um, and took a little bit of money off the table for myself to make sure I could be somewhat whole, but, um, but really stayed, stayed engaged, um, for another year. And, and, um, you know, the rest is, is history. You know, I had a frog box. Explain what, oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, um, so yeah, so frog box, you know, at the time we were looking, you know, I had, I had trucks, I had a warehouse, I had a lot of staff. I didn't have a lot of jobs. And so um, I was looking like, what can I do? How can I make sure I keep these employees? How can I make sure that, you know, I'm uh, covering this rent, these types of things. And so um, so there was a, a gentleman by the name of Doug Burgoyne um, who was from Vancouver, very familiar with the 1-800-GOT-JUNK model. And so he ended up just dialing me up one day and he just kind of told me about this idea he had and how he was considering franchising this concept, which is, it was basically, it's, it still is, it's sustainable moving supplies. And so it's basically like these plastic totes that we would bring to you in lieu of cardboard, you would pack them and then we would come pick them up or you would pack them, you'd move, you do your U-Haul and then we'd come pick them up at your new location. And so you didn't have any waste and uh, it was a, it was a neat neat idea, but you know, um, for me, the model didn't pencil the way that I that I initially really hoped. I mean, we had to go out to the person's two different properties, right? And so that's mileage and windshield time and all these things. And mm-hmm. and so you know, so I I held on. I was you know because I was early in, and and uh, and I am who I am. I kind of needled my way into some ownership share, and so I'm still actually part owner of the company. Um, but I sold back my franchise to the corporate, um, location and got out because what I was looking at, especially when I was dealing with this implosion and all this stuff is I was spending a lot of time worrying about that business, working on that business, washing boxes, doing all the labor intensive stuff with that. But yet I had this, this business that had just, you know, I just lost a million and half half in revenue. Like what if Mm -hmm. I spent my time trying to get that back? You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it was really just, I had to reprioritize where my time was. And, and, um, you know, I still love the business. I still see the trucks once in a while. And it's, um, I, I still think it's a great concept. It was just, it was tough to monetize in a way that really made it profitable for an owner operator like me. And geez, you're going through dealing with cancer, your own health journey and everything. Was this around the time that you got Jay involved? Like how did you manage all these businesses while you have your own health issues to deal with? Yeah. So, um, so let's see the move with tacoma was around when i brought jay in so jay was 
kind of part of that. Um, uh, but yeah, he, he helped, you know, I had some, I've had some great people, you know, at the end of the day, um, I'm a people manager. I mean, you're right. I ran call centers. I mean, I remember having a, a boss that wasn't my favorite boss. And she came to me and she's like, she's like, Jeff, I don't understand it. She's like, people do stuff for you just because you ask them, not because they have to, you know? And I'm like, well, isn't that how it's supposed to be? Like, you know, that's how relationships work, you know? And, and so, um, so, you know, we, we circled up and I've always, always managed to keep some really great people. And, and that's, I mean, I really believe one of the secrets to our success is we've, we've created a really awesome culture and, and, you know, we believe in our people, we back them up, you know, when they experience tough times, obviously I've experienced more than my share of them. So when they experience them, we, we work with them, we work through, I mean, you know, I don't think Jay would mind me telling you he's had his own bout with cancer and we worked through that. And so, so we're all cancer free and we're ready to kick ass and get through this, this, whatever dip we're going through. And um, yeah, it's, it's been solid. We were around 2012. You had stepped away from being CEO um, and you actually left the business for a little while and you went back into working in a job with T-Mobile while retaining an ownership uh, in the business. So tell me a little bit how that managed with you. And you've, you you're not obviously not in an operational role as CEO anymore. Yeah. So when I um, decided to partner up, um, one of the deals I made with my uh, partner, my new partner, was that I would stick around for a year, kind of train and then hand off operations. And then essentially I'd kind of get lost because I wanted, you know, I'd been the founder, I'd been running that business for several years. Everybody knew kind of I was the, the top guy. And so I wanted to, out of respect for Ben, I wanted to kind of let him um, overtake operations. And But what um, does so that I mean, like on, get lost? Like, I mean, well, do you get a report was, once a month? Do you, yeah, you check in an yeah. hour a week? Like, what, what does it look like? Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm still a board member, you know, I'm a 45% owner. Right. So yeah. at that time, you know, I agreed like, look, I want to weigh in when it comes to major marketing buys. I want to weigh in when it comes to strategic decisions, things like that. But as far as the day to day and how you're going to manage, you know, the trucks and the fleet and everything like that, I deferred to to Ben because he was now the majority partner. And, uh, and that was kind of me, me acknowledging the fact that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, follow his lead when it comes to that stuff. So, Got it. Okay. So, um, you know, and we, we had agreed kind of during the negotiations of the partnership that anytime either of us worked in the business, we would be compensated for that work outside of traditional, um, uh, profits, you know? So, yeah. um, so he was taking a more managerial role. And so therefore, you know, he was involved in the, the minutia a little bit more than I was. I was a relatively absentee owner still getting profits when we had them. But again, we were super small then because we had just shrunk. Yeah. And so, um, and so I wasn't leaning on the profits at all. And I actually went because I had a bout with some health issues and, and, and a bout with cancer, you know, it was really important uh, and growing my family was really important that I had, you know, kind of the traditional healthcare benefits and, and whatnot. And yeah. Um, dealing is with that Obamacare part of why stuff. you went to go work? Is that part of that's why you one of the reasons? And that's then that really was one of the re- things that really spurred me to partner up because I didn't want to dissolve, of course, go away from the business altogether or completely sell out of the business. I wanted the upside and I knew it was going to come back around, but I was also had some immediate health concerns and some other yeah. things that we wanted to address. So, so this was kind of a, a, a win-win for both of us, you know, Ben, um, I, I, I think I may have mentioned previously, but Ben, you know, he had started in um, running the San Diego business and then he, he had bought into the, um, uh, uh, Portland and uh, Vancouver, Washington area franchise as well. And so it was a pretty good synergy just to bring him into my business, which was more kind of Western Washington. And um, and so then we started kind of running them together. I stepped away, went went back to T-Mobile for a while, helped run their, basically ran their um, uh, vendor relations for their uh, financial services division, which was right in the realm of what I used to do previously. So now, if I'm being do, honest, it, it was a little bit of a swallow that pill. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was going to ask you. I mean, I yeah. <laughs> I can tell you yeah. I've interviewed a lot of founders that go and then take a job oh, or yeah. employment, no, usually because they exited hungry. their business. Yeah. But I mean, how did you manage that? Well, um, for one, it was, a, it was a strategy, right? I knew there was going to be an end game. And it was, look, we're just trying to, we're trying to give, our, give the business a little breathing room. You know, yeah. I was leaning on it as a, at the time, a sole owner. And that was my, I was 
that was my sole income, you know? And so, yeah. um, so when things got really tight and we got small because of the downturn and we lost half of our revenue, like I couldn't be taken an executive salary. Yeah. You know, so yeah. went back to T-Mobile, drew a nice, a, a decent enough salary. Um, I knew the business. So I stepped right in and kind of helped added some value right away, which was, uh, you know, was personally, personally rewarding. So that helped mm -hmm. take a little bit of the sting away. It was playing in a sandbox I knew. So I, you know, I knew all the players in that, in, in that business. And so it was like reuniting with old friends again, you know, I'd been yeah. out for 10 years, but, um, but, uh, but, you know, that was fairly short winded. I mean, I had agreed when I took the job because they were concerned I was a flight risk because they, they knew, you know, they saw the writing on the wall. I was a little yeah. overqualified for the work I was doing, but, but I committed, I said, look, I'll, I, I'll come back for three years. I'll turn this program around. I'll build, you know, I'll, um, and then I'll find my replacement and, and it'll be, it'll be a win for all of us. And that's essentially what I did. Hmm. So after three years, um, I kind of had felt out the field and realized that, you know, where I wanted to be was on the vendor side, on the more entrepreneurial side. And so, um, a guy who is in the industry, who had been my mentor for years, um, was doing some interesting stuff in the industry. And so I, I agreed to go back and work for him for a while. And so, um, and so that brought me all the way up to COVID. Um, I worked for him for about three years, was a um, senior vice president of essentially global marketing and sales for him and um, traveled, got to, you know, take clients to India and travel and, and do some really fun things. And, and that was, you know, it was good. It was, um, and also got to work with someone who I, who I really admire and, and, um, and kind of see how he operated and, so, were, there, were there any growing pains during this period of time? We're talking 2012 to COVID happens in 2020 is an eight year period when you're um, still a very large owner and a big chunk of the business, yeah. but you're not an operator in it. And well, you know, I took a lot of it personally. I took a lot of the pain away by saying, I'm not taking it. I don't care if I make profit, right? Because I have a day job now. Yeah. I can cover my mortgage. I can cover my health care. Right. So. So that kind of gave me a little bit of a break. And then um, what it allowed the business to do was to really apply some financial discipline within the organization. You know, for example, I mean, my partner and I, since the day we partnered, you know, well over 10 years ago now, um, we've never, um, every time we take a profit check, we set 20% of it aside to reinvest back. In Just a simple concept. But what that's allowed us to do is, you know, between the two of us, we have over 50 trucks. They're all paid for. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So and that's all for money that, you know, we would have gotten sucked up and just probably spent on something else. But we've reinvested, con consistently reinvested in the business. So, in fact, the last 10 years has been almost the opposite of growing pains of we've we've made the business really healthy mm -hmm. and um, and been able to scale it. And so now it's um, I mean, well, you know, put it in relative terms. I mean, we were doing you know, just after, you know, I kind of lost, lost my wind because of the the downturn, we were doing just under a million and now we're doing 10 X that. And so, um, so that's been a really kind of a fun ride. And what that's allowed is when COVID hit, um, I was at the time 48 and a half years old and I was kind of holding out, trying to keep the what I call the day job, keep, you know, keep that train on the tracks for another couple of years. And I figured when I was around 50, maybe I would go back into business, but um, kind of use COVID as a, uh, as a reason to say, you know what, I'm a global salesperson. Nobody's making any moves. I can't even travel. Like maybe now is the time to make the move. And so I got back with my business partner, Ben, and renegotiated a role within the organization where I thought I could add some value. Um, and agreed to um, kind of wearing the founder hat, be the face of the business again a little bit more. Because keep in mind, he's down in the kind of Portland, Vancouver, Washington area. I'm up where the heart of our territory is, and so um, and so it made sense. And you know, and 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 that's a little bit more my personality, a little bit less his, and so it played to my strengths. And so um, so that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, looking looking at some bigger opportunities within the organization and trying to round out some of the edges obviously going from a million dollar company to a 10 million dollar company you know um any inefficiency it's a very, start to very different company and it's yeah, also a very it's a different company you step back into yeah yeah absolutely in fact you know i'm just coming off of just a 
really fantastic meeting I had today with the team. And it's, you know, it's fun to work with players that all have expertise in their field and they're all working toward the same cause. And it happens yeah. to be the business that I started. So it's really, right. It's, right. it's fun and it, it's exciting. And, um, and it's where I wanted to be, you know, one of the reasons I stepped away the first time and partnered up because it was because I had this dilemma of, well, I started the business, but I didn't want to just be a junk guy. Like well, that was my ego maybe, but uh-huh. I was, you know, I'm yeah. like, I, I feel like I have more to offer than that. But what, you know, what me kind of partnering up, stepping away, and then now really taking inventory and now stepping back in the business has allowed me to do is to say, no, here's the things I'm good at. Here's the things where I can really add some value. You know, the, the, the teams like when I come around so I can kind of be the rah, rah culture guy um, and really, you know, execute on that. And then maybe, you know, I can start to go help us think a little bigger, start to act like a $10 million company instead of the, the, the little bootstrap startup that I started. And, yeah. and so that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at with, um, you know, with the junk business and it's, it's fun, you know, and like I said, because we have scale, now we can start to really look at some things and create new spinoff opportunities as a result. You know, yeah, so. I want to hear about those, what do you have in mind? But um, taking it back to when you had the conversation with Ben about you coming back into the business, and now this is fraught with potential danger, right? Like yeah. the business is yeah. very bi- much bigger now than it used to be. You're the former CEO, you're the founder, you're stepping back in. You know, if yeah. I'm Ben, I, I I would need some really reassurance that that you're going to step into the role and that it's going to work. So what was yeah. that conversation like? What did you say to Ben to assure him, reassure him that it's going to be okay? You know, this, the, the same thing that Ben told me 12 years ago, I told him two years ago when we renegotiated this, which is good contact, good contracts make good friends. Yeah. And so let's just talk through where the, where the potential pitfalls are. Let's talk through kind of what we both want. Let's, you know, and we've, you know, that's been one beautiful thing about our partnership is we've, we've always been very open, very honest, and we've just talked stuff through right right as it's come up and it hasn't turned into anything big or whatever. But but again, you know, keep in mind, I when I took on a new a, another C-suite title, it was um, a lot of this stuff's probably operational, relatively operationalized right now. So it's not like I'm upsetting the balance of anything or whatever. Because really, it's a bigger it business, more, there's more yeah. stuff that's that's kind of yeah. ironed out and you don't need yeah. to fix and, things. Okay. And, and yeah. I've been involved in the big decisions all along and I haven't been completely absentee. Like all my, all my ops managers know me and I have independent relationships with them all. But really what it did was it allowed me to go to Ben and say, hey, Ben, why don't I formalize some of this? You know, I'm going out, I'm taking Jay, uh, you know, up at the Woodenville shop out to lunch once a, once a month. Why don't I do that and kind of help and help him coach him a little bit more formally, do some of that, because that's an area of interest to me. And, and so it was a really good, it was a really good kind of fit. And it fit kind of given the size, you know, you can imagine Ben's bandwidth, you know, starting overseeing this little company. Now he's overseeing this huge yeah. company. Yeah, and certainly, by the way, yeah. it's regional yeah. and it's virtual and, yeah. and he has other operations. So yeah. So there so probably was, was a big part of him that was relieved that you were going to step in and relieved. take over the people. Yeah. 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 He was relieved. And in fact, in fact, this new venture that we'll talk about in a bit, um, that was another one where it's just, we've been putting it on the back burner, putting it on the back burner. But when I finally stepped up and said, okay, I'll, I'll run with it. He's like, Oh, thank God. Yeah, yeah, do it. Let's do this. It's awesome. It's going to be great. But, you know, but a guy can only do so much. You know? So, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's but that's the fun part of where our team is and the size we are now is that we're starting to get some some real bench strength. So you know, I went some- uh, let me ask you this. Two nights ago, my friend Rob um, did a, a, a talk and he had a negative experience with a chief people officer on his team. And okay. in his experience, what happened was, you know, the chief people officer, p- chief chief people officer, CPO, let's just say that. Um, he it came in and first thing they want to do is fly around to all of the offices, which he's got a global workforce. So that's expensive. Meet with all the teams. And then he basically became an advocate for pulling every team up to the highest level. These are his words, highest level of benefits, of, of perks that each of the offices w- were. And he kind of you know, a, a number of years ago now, but had to had to reorganize all that because what he found is that it just uh, it almost sunk the company. 
So yeah. I just want you to reflect on that. And how do you avoid as chief people officer becoming like the internal advocate, just saying, oh, we got to get all the benefits for all the team and to the, yeah. to the point that it damages the mothership, so to speak. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what I've noticed is different organizations have different, um, I guess, w- terms. And, and if you call it chief people officer, they think of different things. I say chief people officer because we've always said we're all about the people. It's the team and the people and the culture that build this in, infectiousness and this, the blue Kool-Aid that our customers love and why, why we've grown and who we are or whatever. And so, um, so, but, but there's also this chief people officer as being HR. And then there's also this chief people officer as being, I got to be the guy that battles all the other executives ever. And so, so I'm trying to fall somewhere between all three of those. Um, keeping in mind, I'm also, you know, a major shareholder, so I'm not going to be trying to just give away free money or anything. But, yeah. but um, for me, it's more about stepping back in enough to say, look, I want to help the organization understand what our mission is, what our corporate, what our priorities are. You know, um, I'll, I'll give you just a quick example. Um, you know, one of uh, you know, throughout in a franchise business, different franchises run and, and manage their cost structure differently. I, you know, we tend to be more of a, okay, if we bid it at this, this is what it's going to be. It may, it may be a little sticker shock, but that's going to include everything. And we're going to wow you with the experience. And if it costs me more then I'm going to eat the cost. Of it. That's kind of how we've always done it. Not necessarily the best. And then some people go and they say, uh, they like to do these things like, oh, well, we charge quite a bit less, but if you do this, we got to charge more and you got to do this. And so it's, a, it, you know, it kind of, to me, has a little bit of a, almost a bait and pitch, switch feel or whatever. And it's like, it's like, for me, that's an opportunity for me to share with my team the reason we do things the way that we do. We lean in to issues. If we have a problem, we go talk, we pick up the phone, we call the customer we had a problem with. Can I drive a truck out there? How can we fix it? Yeah, it might be, you know. And so... And so it's just a, a way of a way we do business and a way of a mindset of the way that we, we speak. And as we grow, I think sometimes we get away with that. And and I think what I was noticing is with some of my teams, I think they were thinking, you know, started to refer to management and corporate and 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 it's like, no, that's not who we are. You know, yeah. we are, you know, we do what we say, everybody wins. I mean, this is what we're trying to build, you know. And so yeah. um, and so it was a way for me to stay tied in with the team, stay tied in to sit down with my ops managers to understand, you know, the guys in the trucks and and to share my perspective, not only as a as a chief people officer, but as the founder and as some, as a chief visionary of the company. Like, hey, this is what we're trying to do, you know. And if you stick with us, there's opportunities. And hey, have I introduced you to so and so? He's da da da, you know. And and yeah. start to really yeah. show people that that there is opportunity to not only build bench, but also, you know, build a, you know, um, kind of a career path through our organization yeah. Yeah. and, and, and figure out how we do that too, because, it, um, because we, we didn't always do that, you know? Yeah. And so you mentioned now you're looking at things like, um, spinning off different parts of the company new opportunities. Talk a little bit about what you're looking at. Yeah. So this is super exciting. I'm happy to share with you. Um, I'm guessing by time this airs, we'll, we will have done our soft launch so I can, I can share this, but this is hot off the presses, but so basically for years, um, you know, we've been, well, we've grown my business to be essentially Western Washington's largest junk removal company. And we pride ourselves on, you know, we've always tried to be super innovative when it comes to how we recycle and repurpose and do this stuff. But we've done it all based on location on very kind of a nuanced kind of boutique way based on what each location's demands are and what the resources are and who my diversion partners are. So what we're going to do now is we're starting a, another company. It's called um, Repurpose Center, RPC. Um, and, and well, I'll tell you the mission. because The mission really excites me. Um, it is, we rescue the unwanted, reignite creativity, and build, build a greener future together. So the idea is um, to own 100% of the diversion strategy for my other company. Yeah, um, that, that's what and I was that gonna... will create. And what that will do is it'll create a separation so we can be the best at junk acquisition in the in the Pacific Northwest, which we already are. And then I can build I can spend my efforts and let Ben focus on that first company. Got it. And then I could spend my efforts saying, 
I'm going to be the most thoughtful, community-focused, partner-driven, mission-driven diversion company in the Pacific Northwest as well. And so super it's, excited. It's, we, it's more of kind of like a vertical integration. You're, you're yeah, owning more of it, the process then. Yeah. And so yeah. a lot of it, I mean, a lot of the actual ownership will be some of the same people, but the players will be different. And what we've discovered is, you know, essentially I have, you know, five, five locations that covers 160 mile span, right? So it's a big operation. We have 50 trucks running around. And yeah. so those 50 trucks will now have a system to divert that. We will have a list of, you know, preferred diversion partners. Um, my, my wife, who's, um, I'm super excited. She's just graduating with a degree in, uh, uh, organizational uh, and industrial and organizational psychology, but she'll be taking on all the, what we're calling purpose partners. And so that will be all the local charities that we can give to, that we can divert to and stuff like that. She'll mm -hmm. be managing all that network. And then my, uh, my, my partners on the, on the other side will, you know, continue to manage the bulk recyclers, the, you know, independent recyclers, all that. And so, you know, we believe we, we're going to be able to actually really kind of scale this thing and hopefully turn it into something that could be a model for other um, you know, junk and hauling and companies like that. Is that create a revenue opportunity for you, for you? Because you're getting yeah, paid there's by some. the customer I mean, to remove the junk, but sometimes the junk turns out it's got value. To yeah, it, right? yeah. I mean, there's you know obvious revenue streams are you know we get paid for metal, right? You know, so metal is one of our big recycling part. Big, you know, I call it a bulk recycler, but our bulk recycling partner. Well, that metal money will then go into this new company, Repurpose Center, and then with that money. Now we can use that as fuel for some of these charitable Got initiatives, yeah. some of these community initiatives, some of these clothing drives, these things like that. And then, and then we have, you know, there's, you know, sometimes there's a resale opportunity for some of the items. We could do stuff through, you know, through through our website. We'll be able to sell stuff and and um, you know wholesale sale and do things like that. And so, yeah, so there'll be there'll be um, decent amount of revenue. Really, it's about gaining efficiencies and then. And then obviously, like I said, the last line of our, you know, is to try to be more green, be better. I mean, that's, I think our customers, well, I know our customers on the junk side, they want that. They want to know one of the reasons they don't call a junk removal company is because they don't just want it to go straight to the landfill. Right. They don't want so to now throw if it I can show junk, them yeah. and I can demonstrate yeah. them like, hey, what we're doing, um, this is, yeah. this is actually what happens to it. And it's not junk to us. There's value yeah. in it. And we break it down to a small enough level that we extract that value out of it. And hopefully, like I said, the best part about it, the part I'm most excited about that's more that's aligned with kind of where, you know, I want to take my legacy is we're helping all these little startup businesses. You know, we got, you know, I mean, we work with, I mean, obviously, you, you heard of like the panic rooms where people smash stuff up. I mean, that's the very, very, very tail end of the cycle. But we're working with, you know, um, South King County animal rescue we're collecting pet carriers and cages for when they have to rehouse mm. animals you know mm. they're getting all of our cages and then you know clothing companies are getting you know so just all these different yeah. things so all these pieces will be broken down and we'll leverage it at a on a larger scale and so you know i think we can get some really good efficiencies and i'm hoping to find some good community partners that kind of believe in what i'm doing and we could put together some really cool initiatives where we you know, can, partner with, with different entities and do yeah, some cool can, stuff. Can you help me to understand like now for every like dollar that comes in from a customer paying you to haul away their junk, like do you get a nickel from reselling that material and, and, or what, what is it? And then, yeah, I mean, what do you see it going to in the future? Could it get to the point where for a dollar you, you get paid from a customer, you also get a dollar on the back end or would it never get that high? I don't think it'll ever be dollar for dollar, but I think it could be, you know, dollar per 20 cents or something. I mean, instead of, you got to understand, I mean, 20 years ago when I started this business, you pick the stuff up, not a lot of recycling options. You take it to the dump, you pay 150 bucks a ton to get rid of it. Mm, so mm, mm. that it, it ends up being 20, you know, you have a line item that's 20 that's, or 25% yeah. dumps, you know? Yeah. So, you know, obviously if we can get the dump side down to whatever, five yeah. or 10%. Yeah. And then the rest of the stuff we're diverting by either monetizing it or giving it away in a way that's helping and yeah. keeping it out of the landfill. I mean, it's just going to be, it's going to be just fraught with awesomeness. Yeah. That's exciting. I'm really excited for it. Yeah. yeah. That's really exciting. Um, that's cool. And that's fun that you get to step back into the business and get excited and energized about this new 
challenge that you get to yeah. you know, focus your energies on. That's really fun. Yeah. 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 And that's, and that's the funny thing I found. It, it's really interesting that it's coming to, together the way that it did, because for years people would be like, you know, that's the number one question you get. What do you do with the junk, you know, or whatever. And, yeah. and it's, and I'm like, well, actually it's pretty interesting. And I tell them a story and I'd always, and I, and I'd always end up saying, well, you know, it's my favorite part of the business to be honest, because there's so much cool stuff and da, 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 da. So now to be able to really thoughtfully go through it and create an or, a, a program and an organization, and really it's, you know, like I said, we're calling it a repurpose center, but really it's a repurpose network that we're going to put together. And that's going to be really fun because that leans into, again, some of my strengths, which is, you know, harnessing energy, connecting people. Yeah. Stuff yeah. Like that. Um, Jeff, I, I, I love to wrap up with um, a question that I call my gratitude question. And I love to give people the space and the opportunity to um, acknowledge people that help them in their journey. And you've mentioned Ben, and you've mentioned other people in our first session together. Um, but I love it, especially when it's peers or contemporaries or maybe a mentor along the way or a business partner. But who would you want to acknowledge for just helping you in your journey? Yeah, I mean, there's, I think, three obvious, well, four obvious people come to mind. First would be my wife, Lynette, um, you know, with me through this whole journey. While I'm an entrepreneur, dealing with cancer, dealing with downturns, dealing with whatever, she, you know, she she constantly believed in the plan. So, you know, so you got to give her props. I mean, it, it's not, a, it's not easy to be married to someone like me, you know? Um, and then, um, and then, you know, my, my partners, I mean, Ben and Ben and my general manager, Jay, who's also a partner in, in one of my businesses, you know, those two have just been fantastic. And, and I think they're an example of, you know, when you find the right people and you connect with them and you can complement each other with, varying skills that you bring to the table it, it's just it, it's fantastic and you know and then the last one would be uh rick hunter who's my he's been my personal mentor for 20 25 years and and he's um he's just been a great uh kind of a um a great model for how you um uh treat people and um and grow with people and build your network and don't burn bridges and, and everything he said 20 years ago has come true for me and so i got to give him props uh, Jeff, this has been great. Where can people go to um, connect with you or to learn more about your businesses? Well, um, we're going to be launching a repurposecenter.com website. But uh, in the meantime, uh, jeffrostyles at gmail.com will get me. It's J-E-F-R-O-S-T-Y-L-E-S at gmail.com. Good way to get a hold of me and um, happy to connect and really enjoyed uh, chatting with you. Don. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.